Good morning or good afternoon, actually, and thank you all for connecting with the Pennsylvania Game Commission today. My name is Lori and I will be managing today's session. The session will be recorded and we plan to upload that recording to the agency's YouTube channel. Uh, you can turn on your live captions using the three ellipses, those dot 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 at the top of your screen on, uh, where it says more, and you can send us questions at any time by typing, typing into the chat feature. Be aware that everyone will see all the items that are entered into that chat feature, and we'll get to those questions kind of at the end of the presentation. And I think that takes care of all of the housekeeping items. Uh, with us today is Tom Keller. He is the Pennsylvania Game Commission's fur bearer bi biologist, and I am so glad that he is able to join us today to teach us about the American Martin. Without further ado, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Tom and let him introduce himself and get started. Thanks, Lori, and good afternoon, folks. I'm super excited to be with you today. And this is just a great opportunity to get to share kind of where we're at in this process of potentially reintroducing another species to our state, which is really exciting. And so um, I did want to say before we jump into the formal presentation, if you weren't able to catch our last webinar or some of the things that we're working on, I'd encourage you to go back. In that first webinar, we really looked at uh, what we call our feasibility assessment, and that really introduced folks to the Martin, some of their biology. We also looked at habitat and we looked at things like, could this potentially impact other species in our state? Do we have habitat in Pennsylvania to support a reintroduction at this time? And so I'd encourage you to go back, check that out. You can find all this stuff on our story map and our story map, you'll see I have a QR code at the end of this presentation where you can go, or you just go into your favorite search engine, type in PA Martin and our website will come up and, and it's usually the first thing up where you can go in and find as many resources um, uh, as you can possibly want to learn more about the Martin. So with that, I'm going to shut my camera off for a second. As Lori mentioned, if you have questions throughout um, the uh, talk, I just encourage you to go ahead, write them in the chat. And then as soon as we're done, we'll, we'll try to answer those questions as best we can. Um, and then I can cover a few frequently asked questions uh, if there aren't many questions. So with that, I'm going to turn my camera off. I'm going to share my screen. And then we're going to launch into American Martin Reintroduction and Management Plan and what that means and what that looks like. Okay, so you should be able to see th that screen there and this uh, little animal that has been lost here for about 120 years to Pennsylvania. And this is the American Martin. And we're going to talk about a reintroduction and management plan that was developed to help guide this process through if uh, we decide to move forward with reintroduction. And so when we talk about a plan such as this, we need to first understand that this is really part of a long-term evaluation process. And that has really led up to the creation of this plan. But where that started, that actually started as early as 2018, 2019, as we started to talk about what types of goals we wanted in our next strategic plan for our agency. And one of those goals for our 2020 to 2023 plan was to start to look at uh, Martin reintroduction, and whether that was feasible, and if it was, then what would a plan look like? And so the first part of that goal is to develop this feasibility assessment. You can also find that on our website and I encourage you to take a look. I kind of describe what that all entails. And then once we had that in place, the next part of that goal was to develop a long-term management plan and reintroduction plan for the Martin. And you can see uh, this goes from 2024 to 2033. That's the first initial 10 years as we would explore a reintroduction in Pennsylvania. Now, when we talk about a reintroduction plan, there's several primary goals that we need to consider within that plan. The first of those are really cooperative partnerships. So do we have partners that are willing to help us with this? And as most of us are all aware, this is such a massive undertaking that we cannot do this without partners. We cannot do this alone as an agency. So we need help. And so we'll, we'll kind of explore what partnerships we've developed for this project. 
we also look at translocation. And this really just means how do we move an animal from one place to another? And there's a lot of details in a plan for translocation. And then we look at research and monitoring. So not just have we brought the animal in and released it, but what can we learn from this project? How can we measure success or failure? And so that's a really important part of any plan. And then there's the information education. As I mentioned, this, this species has been gone for so long. There's been generations of Pennsylvanians that have come and gone without the Martin on the landscape. So we really have to refamiliarize ourselves as Pennsylvanians with what this species is, what it eats, where it lives, and all of those things that are important to understand. And then finally, population management. And so once a population would be established, how do we manage that into the long term, into the future? And that's what we do for many of the other species in Pennsylvania. We have these long-term management plans, but what all does that entail? So we talked about partners and we know they're key to reintroduction and we've split them into several different categories. The first are, are our release partners. And so when we think about these partners, we're thinking about our big public land owner uh, agencies within the state. And so there's really three that own a large majority of public lands within the state. The first being DCNR. They own a huge amount of state forest and state park lands throughout the state. And then we have the Allegheny National Forest, which is owned and managed by the U.S. Forest Service. And that's up in our northwest, north central part of the state. And then, of course, we have our own agency, the State Game um, and, and what we're talking about there is game lands. And so we're, we're talking about 1.6 million acres of state game lands throughout the state of Pennsylvania. And so fortunately, we have good support from both the U.S. Forest Service and from DCNR. And we've re received letters of support from those uh, agency administrators to let us know that they are on board with this project. The second are source partners. And so we can't move forward with the reintroduction unless we know we have potential sources for Martin. Now, fortunately, Martin are very um, abundant in many other states uh, and provinces throughout North America. And so we began to contact Canadian provinces and states, and we're still talking with many of these states and provinces, but we've received letters of support from Maine, Michigan, and New York all willing to help with this project should it be approved. And then finally, we have what we call translocation partners. And this is really a wide diversity of different partners that can assist in all the different aspects of translocation. And we're gonna get more into what all that means, but you can see we have partners in wildlife health and partners that would be able to hold Martin, such as Elmwood Park Zoo or Zoo America. We also have partners willing to help with transport, uh, willing to help get animals back into some of these wilderness areas, and then even partners on our borders, such as the Seneca Nation of Indians, where they're right on our northern border, as well as New York, and that's really critical because some of the best areas for release are right on the border as well, and if Martin are going to travel across that state border, it's important to know that we have good support there as well. Now, when we talk about release and we talk about exactly where we would put Martin, the first thing we need to do is go back to our habitat suitability analysis and take a look at that map. And what we see, if you remember from previous discussions, this map is showing us in dark green, we have our best, uh, highest suitability of habitat. And then of course, as that map gets lighter into yellow or white, we have our very poor habitat. And it's very easy to see that the majority of our good contiguous habitat is up here in the north central up into the northwest. And when I say contiguous, what we really mean by that is our well connected, highly suitable habitat. And so this map kind of teases out exactly where those areas are. And you can still see the large majority of those highly contiguous or connected areas are again up in that PA Wilds region at North Central and then of course up into the Allegheny National Forest as well. And when we kind of start to zoom in on some of those areas, we can see where some of these release sites are and we're gonna walk through each one of them. The first 
and foremost is this area called Hammersley Wild Area. This is DCNR owned and managed property. This is one of our largest wild areas within the state. And with wild areas, if you're not familiar with wild or natural areas, these are areas that are fairly hands off management and they're very limited as far as access. So it's primarily just foot travel only. And there's really no roads that go through these areas for the most part. And again, there's very little management done. So these are excellent, excellent areas for a species reintroduction, particularly for a wilderness species such as the Martin. And so Hammersley is right in the dead center of all that really good habitat that we have. So a great starting place. And then the second place we would consider would be a series of game lands. These are to the west of Hammersley. And you can see with these game lands, large portions of those are all really high or optimal habitat. And then in between those, we even have state forest lands and some private lands as well. And so that makes sense because these game lands in particular are being managed uh, more for uh, late successional growth. And that's important as well. Now to the east of Hammersley, we have another series of wild and natural areas. We call the wolf, this the Wolf Run Complex. It also includes a game lands. And this is just an excellent uh, batch of areas that are really, again, more of a hands-off management and provide some really good um, areas for reintroduction. And then we start to head to the Northwest and we're gonna look at two different areas up here. This first one is what we call the North ANF or North Allegheny National Forest portion. And you can see the area below the state line that's highlighted in that yellow or orange, that's really the area we're looking at. But as I mentioned, just to the north of the border, you can see there's a state park and then the Seneca Nation tribal lands. And again, why it's so important to make sure our partners are on board before we would move forward. The other place that we were considering and we will likely not consider because we have good partner support to the north of our border is this southern portion or the south ANF portion. This is also a great area uh, that we may consider in the future, but at least for this initial plan, we likely won't. And then really the fifth one that we're going to consider is this complex we call the Loyal Sock Complex. This is the furthest to the east and we have really good optimal and highly suitable habitat. And this is also a combination of wild and natural areas as well as state forest and of course state game lands as well. And this is important because when we reintroduced otter, when we re reintroduced fisher, this is a very similar model where we select a variety of different areas. They're all spread out enough so that dispersing animals can immediately interact with each other from these variety of founding populations. And what you see is you see genetic diversity start to uh, increase and continue from founding. And then once these populations grow into each other and meet in the middle, you see genetic diversity increase again. So you get a second flush of genetic diversity. And there's real benefit to this based on what we've seen from other models. Now we talked about translocation, but what exactly does that mean? And there's a lot more that goes into it, especially on the coordination and planning side. So when we think about a project like this, we need to think about not just are we coordinating this within Pennsylvania, which is very obvious, but we also need to have coordinators in these source locations. And so we would need to hire coordinators who could work with trappers and holding staff, transport staff and health staff. And this is all very important and we'll get into why that's the case. And we're also working with all those different staff members here within Pennsylvania and then have someone coordinating the entire project from a little higher above. Now, when we talk about trapping, we would start to work in these source locations with some of our best well-known Martin trappers. And we provide them with the equipment that they need, so live traps, holding boxes. And then once they would capture a Martin, they would then get a hold of that coordinator. And that person would come out, pick the animal up, take them back to a temporary source holding location, do an initial cursory health exam, care for that Martin until it's ready for shipment. 
and we say shipment when we're transporting a mart and that could mean anything from in the back of a truck or a trailer or that could mean through the air and we do commonly move animals through the air even wildlife and there's a lot of paperwork that goes along with that and a lot of specific care instructions but we're very successful or have been in the past at doing that and so once they're transported they will be brought to a holding facility for a little bit long more longer term care and this is really a facility like elmwood park zoo or like zoo america and these are areas or uh, folks that have a lot of this in place they have the structure um, and things that are needed they also have the professional staff that are uh, trained at, at wildlife care and we've done this many times in the past with reintroductions and they would be here for additional health screenings as well as fitting them with uh, trains or with uh, radio collars um, fitting them with um, any kind of tags or marking equipment things like that and that's all right before they would go out and be released and release um, could be as easy as pulling off alongside the road of, of a dirt forest road and releasing them if the habitat's correct. But with a lot of these areas, as you might notice, they're wild areas or they're large areas without a lot of roads. So it's really working with our partners to get them back in to some of these wilderness areas and then releasing them. And really what you're looking for is a healthy marten being released into good, optimal, healthy habitat. That's really critical for this project. So that's what translocation really means. It really looks like within this plan. Now, research and monitoring we mentioned is really important. Unfortunately, when we think about the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, there wasn't a lot of research and monitoring around translocation efforts. It was more capture the animal, move it, release it, and call it good. And we really didn't learn a lot from that, but it's so critical that we learn as much as we can. So we need to look at things like survival and mortality. Survival is obviously critical to make sure that animal can last long enough in the environment to reproduce and continue on with the next generation. And if there is mortality, what is that mortality? What are we finding it from? And then we look at movement. So this can be dispersal of young, this could be dispersal of animals just released um, out of a holding box and and really how far are they ranging across the landscape? What do their home ranges look like? And that kind of gets into habitat management as well. And so we built this habitat suitability model, but really when we look at habitat selection and management, is it matching up with the current model? Do we need to adjust our model at all to understand where we have good Martin habitat? And then reproduction. Again, we mentioned the importance of reproduction and really seeing this next generation of Martins. And, and without reproduction, we would not expect to have success. So we need to be able to measure reproduction, how many kits are Martin uh, typical females having, um, and what the survival look like for those uh, young. Diet is one thing that we covered a lot in um, both the feasibility assessment and within this plan. And diet, we looked at 13 different diet studies and, and we looked at all that information to understand could it potentially impact other species and we found it would have very minimal impact. But we need to continue to make sure that once we bring Martin in, that that diet hasn't changed for Pennsylvania specifically. And lastly, species of concern. So even though based on our feasibility assessment, we didn't find any major concern for uh, other species based on Martin reintroduction, it's still important to monitor these species of concern, both pre and post release of Martin. We talked about information education and the importance of doing that because the species have been gone so long. And really, we started that INE campaign as soon as we started this project. And that was really important to spend the last two years getting out in front of the public and trying to reintroduce just what this species is into the public mind before we could get to a potential actual reintroduction. And so the first thing was to look at target audience. In Pennsylvania, wildlife belongs to all Pennsylvanians. And so our target audience is indeed all Pennsylvanians. And so we worked hard 
to try to get out in front of all Pennsylvanians. And we'll talk about how we did that in a variety of different ways. We also looked at partners, not just in reintroduction, but partners in education. And we got lots of partners from within our own agency, but we also had over 40 different partners or outside organizations that helped us get this information out throughout the state. And that was just as critical as what we could do internally. And then message development. So if there are concerns, who are they coming from? And are we answering the questions and developing a message that answers those questions? And so we did a variety of different focus groups, uh, independent surveys, independent interviews. And these were all very important in trying to understand how are we developing a message? Is it appropriate for different groups and for all Pennsylvanians? And as a part of that message development, it's really developing resources. So what we're doing today with webinars, but also videos like you saw at the beginning before our webinar started, um, and we've also developed a variety of one page synthesis of the plan, the feasibility assessment, uh, talking points, FAQs, um, and, and then of course, getting out into other uh, different venues. And that's been really important. And then just conducting a statewide campaign, again, to try to reach all Pennsylvanians. So we have done uh, over 84 different presentations throughout the state of Pennsylvania. And this gives you a good idea on kind of how those are scattered throughout the state, trying to reach as many people in person as well as digitally as we could. And we have figured that we've reached close to 6,000 people in person alone, which is uh, very helpful because some people really like to get their information in person. And I understand that. But we've also tried to utilize as much audio, digital, and print media as we could. So things like our PGC Live events through Facebook. We've also done a variety of other things online and through the digital side, like this webinar. And then I always like to highlight just a few of the things that we've done that I thought were neat and worth sharing. So as part of this plan, we actually developed a uh, art competition to get uh, students, primarily middle schoolers and high schoolers all throughout Pennsylvania to compete and submit artwork to get their artwork into the reintroduction and management plan. And of course, the top three prizes in middle school and high school both received other prizes as well, but we've been able to feature uh, a really diverse amount of art, and it really was heartwarming to see how many wonderful artists we have uh, coming up through the schools in Pennsylvania. And then we've also attended a variety of different places uh, where we could set up a booth and talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, answer questions, hand out literature, and we've even had debates at high schools and middle schools throughout the state um, to get kids engaged and take a side on either side of opposition or support and trying to do the research. And, and that's been really uh, helpful to try to engage students with as well. Now, it's important with every plan that we have a budget and we have a timeline. And you can see here, this is a 10-year budget and timeline, 24 through 33. And what we see is we see a total amount of just over $2 million. That comes out to about 203000 per year. And then you can kind of see how that's laid out. So that first year, if this is approved, will be primarily just that coordination part and preparation. So we talked about hiring coordinators and source states, working out all the paperwork that we would need to move animals, particularly if we get any from Canada across the border, but even state to state. And that takes some time. And then the second year, you can see we would uh, begin translocation. We talked about the five release sites that we were interested in, and we would try to target one release site per year and get enough animals to move into that release site, and then the next year move to the next. So the first six years are really just the translocation part, and then the last four years are really just that monitoring and research, which would continue into the future for the next 10-year plan. Now, we talked about managing a population and what plan management really looks like is a variety of different things. One, it needs to be very adaptive. It needs to be something that can change. It isn't written in stone, and we can pivot. We can make changes as we see 
changes ongoing with the project. It also needs to be long term. We need to have a long term goal set out there that we can really target so that we're not ping pong balling around and we really have some good sideboards or guidance throughout the project. And then we need to talk about harvest because even though harvest isn't one of our primary goals for this project, harvest can be very useful and important. And we think about the 16 fur bearing species that we have in Pennsylvania, that's really how we gather a lot of the biological data that we use to manage them. And that's the same for many of our other game species throughout the state. So harvest can be very useful, but we would expect it would be quite some time before we would see a population that could sustain harvest. And if we never reach a population that could sustain harvest, but it's persisting, we still achieve the goal of reintroduction. And finally, conflict. Now, we talk to other states that have Martin, have had them a long time. We don't really see conflict as an issue, but we wanna make sure that we address that within this plan. And we do have a section on conflict and how we would address any potential conflict with Martin here in Pennsylvania. Now, I do like to highlight all the different folks that have really helped along the way, and this certainly isn't everyone, but what we've done is when we started plan writing, the first thing we did was to develop a committee. We developed uh, a plan, planning committee of a variety of different organizations, stakeholders that we felt were very important. So we invited people like NWTF or Audubon, we invited people like Rough Grouse Society or DCNR, U.S. Forest Service, and it was important to have stakeholders that had different views on Martin in Pennsylvania and ensure that we had a lot of good feedback. And then once we developed this, we actually sent this out to over 75 different organizations and individuals that represent organizations or stakeholders throughout the state and outside of the state to get really good feedback on this and make it a much stronger plan. Now, as far as moving forward, what do next steps really look like? And it's really to follow a proven path and a diligent evaluation process. And what that looks like is going back, looking, did we develop a feasibility assessment? Yes, we did. Did we develop a good reintroduction and plan? Yes, we did. Is it out for public review and comment? And it currently is. And I would encourage you to go and send a comment in after you check out the plan or after you're done with this webinar, because we need to hear from you. Wildlife belongs to you, and these big management decisions also belong to you, and they also require that we make sure we're hearing from the public. And so that's open until November 15th. If you have comments, you can send them in to pamartin at pa.gov. And then once those comments are in, at our next board meeting in January, we will bring that back and we will be providing a final draft of the management plan with a synthesis of all the comments. And that will be in an appendix to the plan. And then we'll provide a report on that. And then we will be asking the board to accept the management plan as it is. If the board chooses to accept it, that basically gives us the green light to start reintroduction. And if the board doesn't accept it, then that would be the end of this project. So hopefully that was a really quick walk through, but hopefully good enough information to give you at least uh, an idea of what that plan entails. Again, this QR code will take you to our story map, which is really um, our, our landing page or a one-stop shop where you can get all the information on this project. Um, here's my information, my email, the email we talked about sending comments to PA Martin at PA.gov. It's my cell phone number. I serve you as your fur bear biologist. And I want to make sure if you have any questions, whether it's about this project or any of our other fur bearing species, you can always get a hold of me at any time. So I am going to minimize the screen a little bit so that I can jump back on the camera. And then I'm going to open up our chat box. Just see if there was any questions. So I don't see any. If you do have any questions, send them in. In the meantime, I'm going to jump back on here and we're going to just take a real quick look at frequently asked questions. 
and some things that maybe you were thinking about, uh, but but didn't really pop into your head. And so let's just take a real quick look at these questions and then we'll head back to the chat box. So the first question a lot of folks ask is how many Martin do we need? This is an excellent question. So we know based on literature that we need at least 60 Martin for a self-sustaining population. So that would be for one of those founding populations. And of course, multiply that by five and you kind of gives you an idea of how many hundreds of Martin we would need. Now we would do that over a five year period. So we really need to capture 60 Martin for one of those founding populations per year. That's also the other reason that we ask a variety of different partners to help. Because going to any one state or province and saying, hey, can you give us 60 Martin? It can be a pretty heavy lift, but if we can split that up among a different variety of states and provinces, that's not only helpful in getting the numbers we need, that's also helpful in creating a very genetically diverse founding population, which is really critical. So the second question we get a lot is, well, okay, well, if you need 60, how many males versus females do you need? So what kind of a sex ratio do you need? And what we found in the literature and what we found from previous reintroduction efforts is that in reality, you need close um, to four to one females to males. Uh, as and, and really the more females you get, the better. But that four to one ratio is really what you're looking for. And so no surprise, females are much more important than males, which is generally the case across most species. And and so that's really why we would try to select um, for females within our capture. And so that's really important. And then how are Martin released? So we talked real briefly about, okay, yep, you bring them into good habitat, you make sure they're healthy and you release them. But really the question would be, okay, you have 60 Martin, you have your release area, how should you release them within that area? And there's a variety of different ways that it's been done in the past. Some it's more of a shotgun approach where you put one here and one here and one here and you spread them out throughout that area. Some it's you put um, you know, all of your concentration right in the middle as they spread out. Uh, you're not losing animals to dispersal outside of your release area. But what we're finding with most recent reintroduction work and some of the literature is we're, they're, they're releasing in these small pockets. So they might release anywhere from five to 10 in an area with really good habitat and then allow those animals to, to spread out some and, and set up their home range. Um, and that seems to be somewhat successful. So even though we laid out all the different um, ways that release can be done, that's how we would likely do it in Pennsylvania. And it's what we would consider a hard release. So it's not necessarily uh, more of a soft release where you would actually build a huge pen in the forest where you're gonna release them keep them in the pen for a while to allow them to acclimate and then release, which is really important for some species. What we found with the Martin is it's not important. So you can do a hard release, which is much more efficient and effective, and you just release them right into that area. Of course, we will have them in holding for a, a, a period of time to ensure that there's some quarantine that we're testing for disease and pathogens, and then of course fitting them with tags or, or um, collars. And that kind of gets into the next question. How are Martin tracked? And so there's a variety of different ways that you can track an animal. But typically with Martin, it's a small uh, radio collar. Now, of course, we have GPS collars, so you don't have to use radio frequencies anymore. And so we'd likely put out a certain percentage of GPS or radio collars on these animals. Not everyone would receive a collar but everyone would receive a pit tag. And that's a uh, pit tag, if you're not familiar, is a little gr grain of rice size electronic tag that they use for pets. And so we also use that in the wildlife world. And so you actually just use a needle, inject that right between the shoulder blades under the skin of a marten. And it's a really effective way to tag an animal without having to tag the ears or a tattoo or anything like that. Uh, which can sometimes cause problems. Um, this is something that's really uh, passive and, and not, um, not causing problems for the marten. And then what we can do is actually, if we catch one, we can scan it, or we can actually set up these scanning devices out in the forest 
and have some type of a lure or a bait that would have that animal go through it or near it that would be able to pick up that individual identity. So a lot of neat technology out there that we have at our uh, fingertips and, and we would certainly use that in this case. And you can see that in the plan we tried to highlight is all the different ways that we might um, try to track Martin. And there's passive ways like snow tracking, um, hair snares, different things like that. We can look at genetic tracking as well. So those are some of the most often frequently asked questions and I'll kind of jump down from there. But um, do see, yep, so we asked, Ray asked a good question about how many are we talking about for each location and what are their natural predators, Kelsey asked. And that's a great question. And we did a lot um, of work on that uh, within the feasibility assessment. But what we found was that their number one natural predator is really the great horned owl, which we have plenty of in Pennsylvania. Uh, but also other forest hawk species and owl species. And then um, in some cases, you will see them being taken by something like a fisher, a bobcat, a coyote, uh, some of those other species. So it's not generally often that, and it's not generally for um, a predation. It's more of like a competition thing. And so that's in the feasibility assessment, we talk about really the importance of um, good habitat and looking at really having the good habitat because this is a fairly small animal and it does have uh, several natural predators that could uh, potentially impact it if they're not in good habitat. And that's why this, uh, the habitat so important and what we call structurally diverse habitat. So yeah, good question. And then Curtis asked an excellent question. Will there be an impact on songbird nestlings? And this was really something that we were concerned about. We had some major concerns when we stepped into this project. One was about songbirds. One was about overall nest predation, whether that was in the trees or on the ground. Um, and then, of course, we have a variety of species in Pennsylvania that are not doing well. Um, and we see species declines in both game and non-game species. And so this was one of those things that we really wanted to look closely at. So we did. When we looked at diet, that was really an important question was, OK, we know they eat birds. You see that in basic literature. They eat birds, it says they eat eggs um, and they eat a variety of other things, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, um, carrion, all kinds of things. Uh, but what was interesting is when we really looked at, into that and in we looked into those 13 different diet studies, what we found is that close to like 75% frequency of occurrence within their diet starts with rodents. Then it goes to actually vegetation, primarily uh, hard mass and soft mass. Then it goes to insects. So that makes up a large portion of their diet. But we do see they eat birds. And what we see as well is they eat eggs. So we were wondering, well, how often are they raiding nests? And that can be hard to get to within a diet study. And so we looked at things like, well, how often do we see eggshells within their diet? And so what we saw in the thousands of Martin that were examined within these 13 diet studies, we found two that had eggshells. So we know they eat eggs, but we know they don't eat eggs frequently. And of course, eggshells can be difficult to tease out, but uh, based on what we see in literature, based on talking with uh, researchers that have spent the majority of their life researching Martin, uh, what we see is that nest rating is really not a major part of their diet. And it's certainly, uh, part of how they're built. And so when we think about how a marten is built in comparison to maybe some of our ground nesting predators like raccoons and possums and skunks, these longer noses, they're really trying to search out these uh, nests, whether it's on the ground and of course there's some in trees. Um, and what we see with the marten is a species because it's small, because it has other predators, it's moving around very quickly and it's designed uh, primarily for rodents. And then, of course, some of the other diet items. So uh, it's a great question. It's just not one that we saw any really potential for a major impact to, to bird nestlings. Um, and then Kelsey asked, how has the Martin's extirpation impacted the ecosystem? That's a great question, Kelsey. And this is a tough one, because if we had a species here and lost it, and we had all this good research to say, what was it like before and after? Uh, it'd be much easier to tell, but what we do know based on some literature is that they did play a pretty major role within our system. 
And within that ecological community, there's two things that really kind of keep popping to the surface. The one is actually seed dispersal. And so they're very important for seed dispersal because of how much uh, hard mass and soft mass they eat, but it's also because they have a huge home range. So they actually have a home range that averages about three and a half miles square. And that's really large for a small mammal. And as they're traveling throughout that home range and eating seeds are also depositing seeds throughout. And that's really critical for many of our tree and shrub species throughout the state. Uh, but also they're important for rodent population management. And, and we know we have other species, coyotes, bobcat, fisher, that are eating rodents. But we also know that uh, because the marten really focuses on rodents, it has a major role to play. And when you look at forest management, some of you folks probably have more experience than I do if you're coming from the DCNR side of things, um, rodents can play a major role in a healthy forest or an unhealthy forest. So trying to keep that population balanced is really critical. But the other thing is there's probably a lot of things we don't know about how important the marten is. And what's really interesting is as we brought other species back along the way, and we've really led the way in the, in the really in the North America and bringing species back, we get to see all these really cool things that these species do for us, for the overall ecological community. And so we have learned a lot over the past hundred years um, about how these species are so important and, and things that we wouldn't have guessed. So that's kind of some of the things that, um, that we've looked at um, and, uh, and some of the things that we, we probably could learn. You know, we have questions about how could they impact uh, tick populations or in that regard, some of the diseases that you know, are spread by ticks. And we don't know, but that's in the plan as well. That's something we should look at both pre and post. Look at prevalence in that area or Martin's making a difference um, in that case as well. So there's a lot that could go into it and a lot we could learn. Okay. Um, so let's see here. I think we've covered most of the questions. What I would say is you have my contact information. Please feel free to give me a call, shoot me an email. If you folks are interested in, in um, a presentation, I'm happy to do that uh, at a, your, you know, an organization that you represent or anything like that. Just let me know and we can try to get that on the calendar. But um, I just want to thank everyone for attending and the great questions and your interests. I would encourage you please weigh in on this. Send an email to pamartin at pa.gov before November 15th and let our board know how you feel about it, whether you oppose it, whether you support it. It's really important for us to know. So take, take a second and do that. But again, thank you so much for your time and thank you, Lori, for hosting. My pleasure. Thanks, Tom, for joining us. And we'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us as well. We hope you'll visit us again some other time to learn some more about Pennsylvania wildlife. Alrighty. Well, we wish you all a great day. Take care, folks. <laughs> bye bye.